Welcome to our NeuroAbilities Hope Talk series. For those of you who are not familiar with NeuroAbility, we provide evaluation and treatment for children and adults with neurological, developmental, and behavioral concerns. And I invite you to learn more about us at neuroabilities.com. I would like to briefly introduce our speaker for tonight, Dr. Mark Mintz. Dr. Mintz is the Chief Medical Officer and founder of NeuroAbilities Healthcare. He is quadruple board certified in neurology with special qualification in child neurology, neurodevelopmental disabilities, epilepsy, and pediatrics. Dr. Mintz is published and has served on the editorial boards of peer-reviewed journals. He has been an invited lecturer at a large number of national and international conferences and has been a neurology board examiner. He functions as the principal investigator on a variety of research grants, clinical drug trials, and other research studies. Dr. Mintz has been an advocate for transforming healthcare delivery systems for the special needs populations, which was, has led to the creation of the NeuroAbilities Innovative Specialty Care Medical Home. He has many research and clinical interests, including neurogenetic and neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, this evening, uh, Dr. Mintz will be addressing what does epilepsy have to do with autism. Uh, presentation will run approximately 60 minutes. We ask that you mute your microphone during the presentation. And if you have questions along the way, please enter them into the chat and Dr. Mintz will address them at the end of the presentation. Dr. Mintz. Hey, thank you very much. So, uh, let's see. So discuss epilepsy and autism, uh, how, how they uh, fit together. First, let's talk about epilepsy and then talk about autism and then talk about how the two of them are very commonly uh, seen together. Epilepsy is a rather prevalent neurological condition, as you can see here. Large number of people worldwide are affected by epilepsy. Um, epilepsy is the concept of recurrent seizures, which we'll talk about. Uh, it can be very disabling. It can really diminish quality of life in people who have seizures, particularly if they're uncontrolled. Um, it could lead to all sorts of issues because of individuals who have uh, a propensity for recurrent unresponsive states. Uh, they could be precluded from certain types of employment. It can limit their normal activities, driver's license, other issues that are very important uh, in life. Uh, uh, they tend to have higher health risks uh, in terms of cigarette smoking and physical inactivity. And there could be uh, side effects from the different treatments that are provided to try to control epilepsy. Um, in uh, epilepsy can be seen in the pediatric population or the adult population. Often it uh, starts in pediatrics and then will last into adult life. Uh, the highest instance, as you can see, of a first seizure occurs in individuals less than 20 in the pediatric age range. Um, so in general, epilepsy tends to be a lifespan disorder. There are certain types of seizures in epilepsy that start uh, as an adult and you don't see them necessarily in childhood or it may have been missed uh, during childhood and became more and more prevalent as an adult. Um, so it's, a, it's something that really impacts the life standard and it could be a very important disorder uh, by itself. And it could be even more problematic when it co-occurs with other disorders and conditions such as autism. So as I mentioned, epilepsy is defined as these concept of recurrent uh, seizures that are unprovoked by any obvious systemic or acute insult. So everybody has a tendency, all our brains are, have a certain threshold for seizures under the right conditions. We might have a seizure, it might be a one-time event provoked from anything from alcohol withdrawal to maybe an impact event. Uh, but really epilepsy then is, is, is a concept of recurrent seizures that are unprovoked uh, or, from, or not from an acute event. Uh, the clinical manifestations can be uh, quite variable because uh, essentially seizures are electrical activity within the brain. And depending on what part of the brain is involved, that will tend to, to tell you what type of clinical manifestation there will be. Uh, and so there could be wide, wide ranges of different types of clinical manifestations of seizures. Um, now, like autism, I will talk about epilepsy as well, can often just be the symptom of a number of biological processes. So it can be the sort of the final common pathway, if you will, of various biological mechanisms and triggers. So just like we talk about the autism spectrum disorders, in a sense, you could also talk about the epilepsy spectrum disorders where seizures or, the, or what you actually, obs or observable seizures, I should say, uh, may just be the tip of the iceberg. And there's many other issues that uh, 
can occur because the biological mechanism might be causing other issues besides the uh, what you observe as a seizure. So it can be a, a quite a complex disorder. Now we talk about seizure types, usually in terms of their onset, whether it's on, focal onset, one part of the brain, generalized onset, the entire brain instantaneously, or a very typical situation where we can't really tell necessarily uh, the onset of the seizure. Uh, and then the other, you know, big issue is what's causing it. I, so I mentioned, you know, there are biological causes of different se of seizure types. Um, one, there's basically two basic types, if you will. There's sort of the structural and the non-structural, or, or if you will, the structural being a lesion versus a non-lesion. Um, so a lesion would be maybe somebody had a stroke or an infection, um, and that and that sets up a situation where part of the brain becomes very irritable and eventually can uh, develop into a seizure phenomena and eventually an epilepsy phenomena. And then there's the non-lesional, if you will, the non-structural for the most part. Um, and, and the large portion of that that we're learning more and more about every day is the genetic causes of non-lesional epilepsy. Um, now, also, there can be infectious causes setting up, and that can, that's overlaps a little bit with structural because an infection could cause a structural problem like a stroke or something like that. Uh, metabolic causes can be from genetic uh, underpinnings. Immune issues also could be from a genetic cause or could be from an infectious cause. So there's a lot of overlap with some of these. So in general, we're mostly dealing with you know these uh, frank structural causes versus something that's uh, relatively non-structural. Let's see. So um, you could then talk about epilepsy. So seizure is the manifestation, and if you have recurrent seizures. And if it fits a certain type of pattern, uh, then we have different sort of ep what we call epilepsies or epilepsy syndromes. Again, the, the epilepsy types also depend upon the type of seizure, be, whether it be focal or generalized or a combination or of unknown, unknown cause or, or source. And these uh, syndromes might be the type of seizure, or it might be uh, certain findings on the electroencephalogram or EEG, which we'll talk about, it might be the age, uh, a number of factors fit in and it forms a cluster and, and then they could call this an epilepsy syndrome. Uh, right now, there's something called the ILAE, the International League Against Epilepsy, and they're developing different uh, sort of named syndromes that are in revision uh, for the last few years and they're still not, not officially approved yet. So, but for the most part, we could just think about epilepsy and seizures as something that's focal, generalized, a combination, because a focal can then secondarily generalize uh, or sort of an unknown onset. And the concept of comorbidities is very important too, because uh, for a lot of people with epilepsy, it's not just the issue of having the seizures. Sometimes the seizures can be relatively controlled, but it may be other uh, issues that are either in some way caused from the same biological source that's causing the seizures, or it could be something that secondarily occurs, such as psychiatric uh, symptoms or some other problem. That's, that would be called comorbidities. And sometimes the comorbidities could be as bad or worse than the primary issue of seizures. So just to illustrate, uh, this here is a, is a uh, image of the, of the brain. And you can see, uh, if you think about this, if you're looking up at the somebody's lying on their back and you're looking up at their head, uh, this would be the right side and this would be the left side and this would be the front or the, or the, or the face. But this is sort of a, what we call an axial slice. This is like, sort of like a horizontal slice through the brain. Um, and this is an MRI, so these, these are what we call the, what we call gray matter, uh, where most of your, your sort of brain cells, your neurons sit, and then the white matter, which are all the connecting uh, fibers and cables, and then there's some deep gray matter called the basal ganglia, and the, and the black area is fluid-containing spaces called the ventricles. Uh, but this is an illustration of what happens in a, in a generalized seizure. It's really involving uh, a large part of the brain uh, all at once, and it could be really, as you see here, uh, it can include both what are called cortical or, or structures up here or, or deep areas as well. Anywhere there's a neuron, there are a brain cell, that, that's, where you, you know, that's where your seizures are, are arising from. You need a neuron or a brain cell to, for this. There's a lot of other types of cells in the brain that are more supporting structures. They don't actually generate the electrical activity of seizures. And a focal seizure, likewise, is something that uh, comes in one area of the brain. It could be a very, very small area. It could be a large area. It could be a small area turning into a large area uh, like this here. And, and again, uh, that will also determine where this location is, what type of manifestation you might have. Uh, 
And of course, it gets then spread to the other side of the brain and actually look like a generalized seizure. So it can be very subtle and then it can become rather dramatic. It all depends on the seizure type, the seizure syndrome, and a lot of other factors. So this is a long list of, uh, of certain types of behaviors that are, can occur during a seizure. And I, like I mentioned, it really depends where electrical activity is arising from. And you can see you can have a number of cognitive issues, uh, just maybe unresponsiveness, uh, staring spells, someone who's, you know, quote, spacing out, maybe missing parts of conversation, very, very subtle things, uh, to, the, to a point where they're frankly unresponsive, uh, to the point where there's actually movements. Uh, and, 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 and if it's involving a large part of the body, it'd be convulsive movements, if you will. So you can see a very long list. They'd be very subtle to very, very dramatic. And a lot of these behaviors you see uh, on this list are not necessarily only from seizures, of course, so they can uh, be from other causes. So sometimes they can be mislabeled. Many people with uh, uh, subtle forms of seizures and epilepsy might get mislabeled as having a psychiatric syndrome. And that's a very common issue. And actually it's being generated by a biological mechanism, in this case, electrical uh, activity of the brain. And uh, that differentiation can be very important. A lot of these people get treated for psychiatric uh, uh, issues with medications and, and sometimes powerful psychiatric medications. And really what they need is a treatment uh, to try to suppress their seizure activity. And then a lot of these behaviors can improve. So like autism, epilepsy has many biological causes. I mentioned the structural causes, and you can see the, the list of them here. Um, it could be something that you're born with, something that occurred during development of the brain, uh, listing here, any, any type of, even a very subtle minor structural change can lead to um, pretty dramatic seizure changes. So, um, uh, and, and sometimes you could have a very large problem in the brain, structural problem, and not have a whole lot of problems with seizures. So it's quite quite variable. Uh, something called neurocutaneous syndromes. They're called that because there might be some clues on the skin uh, when, when people develop as uh, in fetal life, in early fetal life, as the brain is starting to develop, uh, it actually has the same uh, uh, source, if you will, cellular source that, that skin comes from. So sometimes you could find clues on the skin that could uh, tell you that there might be problems within the brain. Neurofibromatosis, you could have these little coffee colored spots on the skin. Tuber sclerosis, you could have these white spots on the skin. So there's different clues sometimes on the skin and that's why they call them neurocutaneous syndromes. And they could have a, a big problem with epilepsy. Uh, tumors are a structural cause again. Uh, infections can, can lead to a residual uh, structural problem, traumatic brain injury. Uh, problems with blood vessels within the brain, something called, uh, again, something that you can be uh, born with, but it could change over time or it might not uh, manifest itself until later childhood or even as adult. That would be arterial venous malformations. Um, uh, other types of problems that occur during uh, fetal life, uh, labor and delivery, and even as a neonate, different types of strokes, neurometabolic disorders, which again can be genetically predisposed. Uh, and sometimes it could just be from the way the brain uh, develops and, and, and communicates. So there could be little areas of this elaborate network that we have within the brain of, of, of uh, brain cells, neurons, and, and, and the connecting cables, the axons. Uh, and uh, so this could be problems in, the, in those connections, if you will, a problem with network connectivity. Uh, but one area that's growing very rapidly and, 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 and really has transformed how we look at epilepsies that don't have an obvious structural cause, like a, like a tumor or a stroke. Uh, and this is also something that's transforming autism as well, is the concept of a genetic cause, or at least a contribution. Uh, and at least 40% of non-lesional epilepsy, or, or at least 40% of all epilepsies uh, may have a genetic risk or susceptibility. If it's non-lesional, there's not, again, an obvious issue like a stroke or a tumor. Uh, in those situations, the, the uh, percentage of finding a genetic cause is increasing uh, every day as we learn more about genetics and, and their associations with epilepsies. Um, so that's a very, very important issue. And syndromic epilepsies in particular, uh, if you have a non-lesional seizure problem and then you have also some associated problem like intellectual disabilities or autism, the chance of a common genetic cause 
for both those issues uh, increase uh, dramatically. Now, shifting over to autism for a moment, um, autism is defined by behavioral and developmental features, uh, but it really is a neurobiological disorder, even though it may be defined by these externalizing uh, behaviors and developmental features, really what, un what underlies autism is, is a biological cause. This uh, cause, again, might also then not only lead to autism, but in some situations might also lead to epilepsy if those are co-occurring conditions in an individual. So autism, you know, really is uh, in some ways a, a misnomer to think about it as a, as a, as a uh, diagnosis, an individual diagnosis. It's really quite a heterogeneous population of bi very biologically diverse individuals that as a final common behavioral pathway may manifest and fulfill criteria for autism. But really, it's really the issue is really what's underlying this from a biological issue. Uh, as you may know, autism spectrum disorder, if you will, is, is diagnosed by uh, a psychiatric manual called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, uh, version now five. There's been many versions over the years. Uh, it's really now been broken down into uh, the concept of social communication issues and restricted interest and repetitive behaviors. Again, these are externalizing features that can be observed and, and quantitated and measured, but they don't necessarily tell you what's causing them from a biological perspective. So you could be diagnosed with autism regardless of the biological cause or contribution. So that leads to a lot of problems when, when diagnosing autism from, from a medical standpoint and how to approach it from a medical uh, standpoint and, and, a, and biological approach is that these uh, criteria for diagnosing autism are rather rather nonspecific, they're rather qualitative rather than quantitative and subjective for the most part. Uh, and again, they could be, you could be assigned with that diagnosis of autism regardless of the biological cause. And really from a medical treatment standpoint, we really would rather understand what causes something rather than just trying to suppress symptoms. Um, so again, when you're dealing, when you're talking about autism spectrum disorder, you're from a biological perspective, it's a very heterogeneous group. It's not just, there's not just one cause for autism, but there's can be there's many thousands of different biological reasons why somebody uh, be, uh, eventually gets diagnosed with autism. And even when they created the DSM-5, you can see here a quote on the bottom, uh, in the task force that created this, they said that uh, neurobiological studies uh, will be useful for determining whether the DSM-5 ASD diagnosis can be empirically parsed into biological meaningful subphenotypes. And what that means is that we really need to define autism by its underlying biology rather than just by its externalizing behaviors, as we do with other various medical disorders. In cancer, we don't talk about cancer. We talk about different subtypes of cancer based upon their location, based upon their what they look like under the microscope, and now even based upon their genetic uh, variants. Uh, and this is something that is also coming now uh, more and more in neuropsychiatric and neurodevelopmental disorders as we understand the underlying biology of these problems. So autism can have uh, many different types of biological causes, just like we talked about for epilepsy. Uh, you can see here uh, a long list of them. That could, these are things that can occur uh, prior to uh, birth and during fetal development. Uh, occasionally, it could be things that occur uh, around the time of birth, after birth as a neonate whether they be infections or other problems. Um, but for the most part, and then there also could be acquired problems uh, after uh, birth. So, so in other words, just like epilepsy, where you could have acquired problems from a, from a stroke or some other problem, uh, autism on occasion also can be from an acquired problem to, to let's say an infection uh, during fetal life. Um, but, uh, and then after birth, there also could be things that mimic and look like autism, just like I mentioned, uh, epilepsy can be uh, mislabeled or misdiagnosed as a psychiatric problem with autism as well. I mean, if you have hearing loss uh, that's undiagnosed uh, during, during early stages of development, you can then develop features, behavioral and developmental features that can be mislabeled and misdiagnosed as autism. Intellectual disabilities as well as developmental language disorders or other common mimickers of autism. But for the most part, uh, autism is a neurobiological syndrome or disorder uh, and there are studies to show that a very high numbers of individuals that don't have an obvious 
acquired cause for autism uh, have a identifiable genetic variant that may be causative in many cases, and in some cases contributory to their autism spectrum problems. Now, something that's been known for a number of years is that uh, individuals with autism seem to have higher in high instances of seizures and epilepsy. And you can see some of, this, some of these studies that are listed here. Um, this is not surprising uh, since uh, seizures can be caused by any change of the brain, whether it be, again, a structural cause or uh, underlying metabolic syndrome or, or a genetic issue. And again, uh, these issues also cause autism by themselves. So it's, so it's not unusual and to, to uh, understand how these two can be connected. Um, epilepsy increases the risk of uh, having a future diagnosis of, of autism if you have epilepsy prior to a diagnosis of autism. Um, epilepsy is associated also if you had a prior diagnosis of autism. So the, you know, there's higher incidence in that situation as well. Um, if you have a diagnosis of epilepsy uh, along with autism, there's an increase in mortality in some studies. Um, epilepsy is also associated with language regression. There are some syndromes which we'll look at that are epilepsy syndromes, if you will, but they're associated with a regressive regression in language function, which of course then becomes, uh, has many of the manifestations that fulfill criteria for uh, an autism uh, spectrum disorder diagnosis. Uh, individuals with, that, with uh, autism and epilepsy tend to have more impaired social functioning than just autism alone. Uh, and then the, the percent of, of occurrence is, is quite high. Uh, these are some older studies, um, and, uh, but it can be as high as 40% or more, but uh, the cumulative risk over, over a lifetime, if you, if you follow individuals into adult life, might be as high as 60, 70%. So it's uh, not unusual that, that you have, again, seizures occurring in individuals with autism, so you have to have a high level of clinical suspicion for them. If you add in those individuals who have brainwave tests, EEG tests, uh, and on the EEG tests have what are called spikes, which are seizure-like discharges on an EEG, but are not actually having observable seizures, then the percent may even go higher. Uh, so you have some individuals, again, just have EEG findings, but don't necessarily have a diagnosis of epilepsy because nobody observed a seizure. So again, these are common associations. Understanding this, this, this connection uh, has shed a lot of light onto the mechanisms of what causes autism and what causes epilepsy because there's such an overlap. So when do you suspect epilepsy in individuals with autism? Well, you know, it's uh, like I said, it's a common co-occurrence. So you really have to suspect it in all individuals with autism to some level, but you particularly becomes uh, an issue if you have what's called an autistic regression. Uh, these would be children that will develop maybe some reasonable language uh, uh, on par with maybe a three, four, five-year-old, and then all of a sudden start to lose these language skills. Uh, and then you do an EEG and you see this very dramatic uh, pattern that looks like a seizure, but they're not actually convulsing or having some observable seizure. So anytime there's a regression in general, uh, that raises a lot of red flags uh, that there's a neurological process of some sort, uh, and an individual has uh, sort of an autistic regression uh, who develops maybe language regression with development of some of these repetitive behaviors, strongly suspect that there may be an epilepsy component. Um, if, uh, you've have, if you have a history of seizures and then get a diagnosis of autism, well, again, that's something that you have to really look at uh, very uh, carefully, history of, of, uh, of a prolonged seizure called status epilepticus. Anybody who has a known sort of meta underlying metabolic or genetic disorder uh, that also uh, will raise suspicions uh, for uh, an epilepsy autism association. But again, you need to consider this in all individuals with autism. Uh, if there's epilepsy symptoms, uh, you know that should raise uh, your concerns and suspicions for underlying seizure events. And that would be anything just from inattentiveness. And of course, many things can cause somebody to be inattentive. It doesn't have to be seizures, but it could be these very subtle underlying seizures. Uh, fainting spells, syncope. Uh, again, that could be just fainting, it could, but also it could be something maybe cardiac in origin, but also it could be seizure in origin. So you have to think about that as well. These repetitive movements, and again, individuals with autism often have repetitive behaviors and repetitive movements. Uh, some of them can be rather suspicious for uh, seizures. Uh, 
uh, sleep disruption could be. And again, sleep disruption being very common in autism, it's most of sleep disruption is not, not from seizures, but it could be, and you have to think about that. Again, a decline in, in cognitive neuropsychological functioning. Uh, psychoses, uh, you know, hallucinations uh, may be psychiatric in origin, but they could also be seizure in origin. Again, some of those long list of behaviors that I showed you earlier, uh, psych, you know, so hallucinations can be part of a, an actual seizure. Um, other unexplained recurrent what are called paroxysmal symptoms. And again, we talked about this concept, uh, just like in autism, you can have this epilepsy spectrum that could run from something that you could observe quite dramatically like convulsions to something very subtle, which might just be a staring spell that lasts a few seconds to the point where you actually just have electrical activity with nothing that anybody observes. But that electrical activity can also cause a lot of problems in terms of cognitive and neurological functioning. So again, the concept of regression, this uh, autism regression can occur for other reasons, but sometimes it can be associated with actual epilepsy, somebody who has seizures, uh, and also could be occurring without actually observable uh, seizures and just have an EEG that looks like a seizure. Uh, one common uh, syndrome that you may have heard of called Landau-Kleffner syndrome or LKS, or some, sometimes called acquired epileptic aphasia. Aphasia is a loss of language. Again, this is a, a language regression or somebody who's had reasonable language development for a few years and maybe even up to five, six, seven years of age. And then there's a very sudden uh, loss of language. Sometimes it's a little more gradual, but it's usually pretty, pretty subtle. And you start to develop these autistic-like behaviors. Uh, so again, it usually occurs in the first uh, decade. Um, and you don't often, in, in Land of Cleft, you can, but you don't often see physical seizures. Um, and uh, the seizures um, will resolve. And then uh, in many cases uh, with treatment or even without treatment, sometimes just a normal natural history. And the EEG in adolescence sometimes will, will start to resolve, but you still might be left with an autism disorder. So you had somebody who had language and now doesn't have language <clears throat> or, or, or not, as, not as good as it once was. Um, and then there's some variants on this that we'll look at in a, in a second. Uh, and there's a lot of variants. Uh, so it's still something that we don't fully uh, grasp and understand. But with the advent of genetics, now some of these disorders can be defined more by their underlying genetics rather than just lumping it into a syndrome called landau kleffner We could really say that certain subgroups have certain genetic variants. And those genetic variants, uh, if we understand what the genetic, what the variant does, uh, that maybe that can explain why they developed this, concept, this uh, language regression. So just to show this is a five-year-old uh, girl. This is an EEG, uh, just very, very, very uh, quickly. These are just different areas where we're measuring the brain waves, different, different locations on the brain. This is the front going back to the temporal or side of the head, all the way back to the occipital or back of, or back of the head. This is the left side, and this is the right side, and then left and right. So you see, just this is just a sort of running along. It's nothing really dramatic here. It looks kind of nondescript. And then um, as, as this particular child starts to get a little drowsy, all of a sudden you see these, these, these uh, blips, these are, these are spikes, start to break through in certain parts of the brain. And then as, as this child fell asleep, it become almost continuous. You could see these, what are called spike and waves. Um, you could see something like this in somebody who's having even uh, a seizure, or a, an observable seizure, convulsive type seizure. Uh, so it's quite interesting that you can have this disconnect sometimes where you have very dramatic electrical changes that can look very similar to someone who's having a seizure, uh, observable seizure, and yet you don't see anything. And this, the individuals with this disorder are just sleeping through the night, uh, though, though their sleep patterns are not necessarily normal. So again, it's broken down into other, other types. Uh, something called CSWS, if you see here, continuous spike in waves during sleep, or um, ESES, you will might have seen that name, electrical status epilepticus of slow wave sleep. And these are individuals, again, that have that spike in wave activity for at least 85% of their sleep. And yet they don't necessarily have any clinical features, any physical features, it's just, e, just EEG findings. The one with CSWS, they could have different types of seizures, and then we, if there's none, you, can call, you just call it ESES. And again, this is associated with deterioration, uh, the psychological and cognitive deterioration. Um, there could be a lot of behavioral changes associated with this as well. 
Uh, the uh, EEG findings can be transitory. They don't necessarily have to be always be there. Uh, so there's a lot of variation in how this develops over time, the natural history of this type of disorder. Uh, sometimes it can be very symptomatic, if you will. So there's some underlying identifiable cause, particularly a structural cause, like a malformation of the brain or deterioration of the brain. And again, with genetics, we can now understand and define some of these disorders by their genetic, underlying genetic abnormalities. Um, there's also a seizure syndrome, an epilepsy syndrome that occurs very in infants. You may have heard of called infantile spasms or West syndrome. It's characterized by a rather chaotic EEG pattern called hypsarrhythmia. And the seizure type, you actually see physical seizures and they're, they're called spasms, uh, that's the name infantile spasms. And this is where infants will just sort of have, they will just flex the upper part of the body and the lower part of the body tend to, tend to come, or it can be very subtle where the head just drops. And again, it's associated with regression. Uh, and the causes can be, again, symptomatic, like something that's structurally wrong with the brain or maybe uh, something that's uh, not known, what they call cryptogenic, and, uh, or maybe an obvious genetic cause like tuberous sclerosis. It's a very common one uh, with, uh, hip, with infantile spasms. Uh, treatment of this can be very important because sometimes treating infantile spasms early on uh, seems to be associated with a better overall neurodevelopmental outcome. And then another, another epilepsy type that you may be familiar with called Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. It's, uh, again, this doesn't have to occur necessarily with autism. It could, this could be Lennox-Gastaut could, could be an epilepsy, is an epilepsy syndrome, but many individuals with Lennox-Gastaut also have autism. Multiple seizure types, these can range from what are called drop seizures, where somebody could be standing and then all of a sudden they just drop, they lose all motor control and just drop to the ground. In and of itself is not a problem, but obviously it can cause physical harm by hitting your head. And so some individuals with Lennox Gastaut or drops, when, when drop seizures are a prominent part of that, have to wear helmets. Um, there could cause, uh, there could be, there usually is cognitive impairment with Lennox Gastaut because it can be a very difficult to control seizure problem. Uh, but, if it, but if you do treat it successfully, it could, it, could, it could improve the situation somewhat. So if someone is uh, sus suspected or has been observed to have a seizure, you know, how do you go about evaluating this and then what do you do about it? So first trying to figure out if some type of behavioral presentation is a seizure or not can be difficult because it can be very subtle behavioral approaches, but sometimes it can be more obvious. And then when you think you have a seizure, then try to go through some checklists, if you will. Is it, is it more focal onset versus primarily generalized? Is it provoked by something? Uh, and then maybe just a transitory problem, uh, or is it an unprovoked spontaneous event? And can you figure out some sort of mechanism that triggered this? And this may, is based you know, a lot on uh, asking a lot of questions about uh, through, through a medical history. And uh, examination might provide some clues, such as we mentioned earlier, some findings of the skin, but other, other examination findings might be important. And looking for other sort of uh, conditions or complications that may have caused the seizure. For example, a cardiac problem. Maybe you hear uh, an irregular rhythm of the heart, and that might suggest somebody who has an arrhythmia leading to uh, seizures. Um, so then, so that's where the examination can provide some clues. And then the EEG is very important. Uh, this is a brainwave test that you may have heard of. Uh, it provides the ability to localize where uh, the abnormal electrical activity is arising from. It tells you just how much uh, burden there is from these spikes. Uh, and at times now you can have a um, simultaneous video assessment. And if you're able to capture an event, you could then say, well, what's the EEG doing at the time of the event? And then you could say, is that event look like something that's epilepsy or is it just a behavior that doesn't seem to be associated with an abnormal electrical discharge? And then you could go further and try to see if there's other features that suggest a certain type of uh, syndrome, seizure or epilepsy syndrome. Then there's different tests that could be done. Uh, important tests in somebody who has had seizures is to understand if there is a uh, lesion of the brain, uh, particularly uh, items that might be amenable to, to uh, treatment like a tumor or an arterial venous malformation uh, and untreated might, might, might be disastrous, but treating early uh, might uh, actually lead to a, a cure of not only the seizures, but, but really prevent uh, 
uh, catastrophic outcome. Uh, electrocardiogram and, and, and sometimes more, more uh, extensive testing of uh, cardiac function is important because anytime there's an abnormality in cardiac rhythm and blood flow, that could also affect brain function and can lead to a seizure. That's not necessarily coming directly from the brain. The seizure is coming directly from the brain, but the trigger might be coming from elsewhere in the body. Uh, laboratory studies, looking at different metabolic factors, because you could have, for example, low sodium that could lead, could lead and trigger to, to trigger a seizure. And uh, nowadays, with the advent of uh, genetics, uh, really, uh, if there's not an identifiable structural cause, uh, you really need to explore for the genetic causes of the epilepsies. Um, after trying to, after you figure that all out, the next thing is the concept of treatment. And treatment, uh, you have to weigh risk versus benefits. And there are many types of treatment strategies. There are those. There are many types of anti-epileptic drugs, uh, and but there are also non-pharmacological treatments, electrical stimulators, dietary approaches. Uh, so really, treatment strategies will depend a lot upon the seizure type, patient type, uh, whether it's an epilepsy syndrome or not. Uh, but there is a risk of uh, not treating seizures. There's something called uh, SUDEP that you may have heard of, sudden unexpected death in epilepsy patients. It seems to be associated with uh, a higher risk of that with uncontrolled seizures. There may be other factors that we still don't fully understand. There may be uh, genetic predispositions and other, other, and even positional issues uh, during sleep. But um, in general, uh, better seizure control it's a rare event, but, but better seizure control can lessen that risk. Um, there's a risk of prolonged seizures, what we call status epilepticus, and that could lead to metabolic changes and could be actually life-threatening uh, if it's not treated acutely, but also uh, sort of treating seizures in general or, or providing prophylactic therapies to try to prevent seizures might, might obviate a uh, episodes of, of a status epilepticus. Um, and in general, there's an overall untreated seizures. Uh, a seizure itself causes a change in uh, consciousness or impairment of consciousness, sometimes fully unconscious, sometimes just an impairment, or it could cause a loss, impairment or loss of motor tone. Uh, and of course, that could lead to physical injury, uh, particularly if somebody's driving, uh, if they're swimming uh, and, and not being monitored, uh, obviously there's a risk of drowning. So there's a lot of situations where a seizure can cause uh, physical harm, uh, and 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 uh, treating seizures and, and lessening their their frequency and their intensity might uh, might uh, help to prevent these type of issues. So overall, people with seizures, even with treatment, have to take necessary precautions. Um, some of the things I mentioned is trying to look for anatomical structural changes. Uh, you could do that through a head ultrasound. Or something, or a, a computer tomography, or a magnetic re resonance imaging. You can see here an MRI machine. Uh, so these are ways to non-invasively look at the brain, the structure of the brain. Uh, you can also look at so that's a structural uh, assessment of the brain, but there's also a functional assessment, uh, looking at blood flow in the brain. These are some of the studies that you may have heard of: functional MRI, spec scan, uh, near infrared spectroscopy. You can look at the brain's metabolic activity through a PET scan or an MRS, magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Um, you could also assess function of the brain by stimulating the brain through transcranial magnetic stimulation or TMS, or what's also called TDCS, um, which is transcranial direct current stimulation. Um, there's other, and then there's the EEG uh, where you're measuring the uh, electrical output of the brain and it's actually measuring neuronal or brain cell function in real time and directly measuring it in a very non-invasive way. Uh, one form of the EEG is called magnetic or magnetoencephalography or MEG, where you're recording magnetic fields that then induce electrical currents. And uh, that's one way to sort of measure the output, the electrical output of these neurons. Or the more common one is just a uh, conventional EEG, but now also what's called high definition EEG, which we'll look at in a moment. And that gives you a better spatial uh, source modeling. So traditional EEG, conventional EEG, really hadn't changed very much. It was first, the uh, first recording was 1924. And in over 60 years, it was basically done the same way. It uses these electrodes, uh, usually up to 21, these electrodes, each electrode being a uh, 
what's called a channel, and you can see this this map on the head where they place the different electrodes and different types of what are called montages or different patterns. Um, obviously, EEG initially was was being recorded on paper, and eventually in the 1980s there was a switch from paper to digital, and now virtually all EEG, with very with very little exception, is being recorded on uh, recorded in some form, some digital form or another. Uh, you could then look at it, if you will, on the monitor uh, as if it was as if it was a paper recording, but but again, it's all digitally uh, digitally ac uh, acquired. Uh, conventional EEG requires these little electrodes, as you can see here on the uh, on top, and you, you need to sort of prepare the skin. You need to abrade the skin, sometimes with a little sharper object, uh, and then prep the skin a little bit, and then you have to use some sort of glue or paste to get this electrode to stay on on, on the uh, scalp. Uh, so this you know could be a little bit uncomfortable. It could also introduce the risk of infection at times. Uh, some of these glues and paste can be a little bit on the toxic side. Uh, sometimes there's blowers to sort of dry uh, the glue. Uh, but in general, you're just getting up to 21 electrodes. And it still takes over 20 minutes to apply in general. Now, you can understand in autism, this could be a big challenge or anybody with a neurobehavioral challenge. Uh, this could be a problem trying to get these electrodes on over that period of time and causing some stimulation to the scalp, especially those that have sensory aversions. Uh, over the years, I mean, there's been ways to try to uh, do EEGs uh, on those that are not cooperating very well, and they came up with these restraints, these papooses. Sometimes people use uh, sedatives or sedation, which I think is a problem because that will suppress a lot of the brain's activity that you're trying to uncover. Um, and of course, it creates a very poor patient experience. It could create a lot of anxiety in those that, with behavioral challenges. If you need to do multiple EEGs over time, you know, this, the next time you try to do that, you know, there could be very, very poor compliance. Uh, and uh, overall, this creates what we call, like to call the underserved EEG population, those that just can't get a very good EEG because of their behavioral challenges and people don't even try. So then there was the development of other ways to put the electrodes on and then expand the number of electrodes, what's called high density or HD EEG. And you can see a, uh, an example here, these create this net and these electrodes are little sponges, which we'll look at, so quite comfortable. And you could put easily on up to 256 electrodes uh, in, in a matter of minutes, as opposed to 21. So uh, typically, uh, we're, in, our, in our practice, we're using 128, which gives you a lot of information. That's almost seven, six to seven times the amount of data that you're, that you're collecting from a sparse array or, or a 21 channel uh, EEG. This allows you to then have much better spatial resolution because you have that many more electrodes. Uh, and so you can really tell where the uh, EEG abnormalities are arising from. Uh, there's also this phenomena of bad channels. Sometimes one of these electrodes are not picking up very well. So you can imagine if you have 21 uh, scalp electrodes and you lose uh, four of them, that's a, that's a large percent. If you lost four electrodes out of 128, it's negligible. It doesn't make any. It doesn't really affect the overall uh, EEG interpretation. You can see this more closer uh, view little sponges you can see there and these little hubs and the net just slips over the head very simply and they can just readjust everything. The sponges are soaked in a saline solution, um, electrolyte solution, I should say. And, um, and that's how you get the electrical contact. So you don't have to braid the scalp. You don't have to use any glues or, or paste. And again, it could go on very quickly and it's actually quite comfortable once it's applied. And here's some other examples. And even babies, it's quite quite easy to put on babies. So again, uh, by utilizing this type of uh, uh, EEG, you can improve compliance rather dramatically. Uh, we reported previously a review of a retrospective review of patients um, with uh, behavioral challenges, and particularly autism, uh, in over a five-year span. And uh, in the age of ten years, you can see here. Uh, sometimes we would prep with an EEG social story, or we would utilize some of our therapists, like our music therapist, to calm people and reduce their anxiety. This is an example of a social story to try to prep somebody uh, for an EEG. 
and you can see that uh, we had 98% of the patients had uh, a successful uh, EEG study without sedation, without restraint on the first attempt. Uh, and again, in a very challenging population, 95% um, were diagnosed of this population were diagnosed with autism uh, on, on the first attempt, again, without sedation or restraint. Uh, and uh, those that had diagnosis of ADHD, oppositional defiant disorder, 99.8%. Uh, so uh, quite high uh, compliance rate, much higher than you get with conventional EG in this population. Uh, those that were unsuccessful, 22 of them, uh, on the first attempt, uh, we uh, then employed a, a behavioral desensitization protocol uh, with our behavioral team. Uh, and out of 22, uh, eight, but then eight, we were able to get successfully on a, on a, on a subsequent attempt. Uh, and the other 14 were offered this desensitization, but did not participate. So, so, so even if we can't get it on the first attempt, we'll probably could get it on the, on the second attempt with, with a desensitization protocol. So overall, 99% plus acquisition success rate. And this just shows you a little bit about the concept of what you find uh, in people presenting with different types of problems and, and what kind of EEG abnormalities, how, how often you can find EEG abnormalities. Uh, this was an abstract that we presented a number of years ago. Uh, this just, if you had a, a history that suggested seizure, uh, you had abnormalities as you might expect uh, over half the time. But again, if you're not actually having a seizure, you may not necessarily see an abnormality on the EEG. Or sometimes you can see spikes even when you're not having a seizure, so what we call interictal or between seizure uh, abnormalities. Uh, but in autism, you know, rather, again, we mentioned before that uh, autism can have, you know, a cumulative uh, uh, incidence probably of 40% or more. So in, in over 200 individuals with autism, we were able to see this 28% uh, of the time. Um, and um, in um, and uh, and then uh, one second, sorry about that. Uh, you can see with ADHD about fourteen percent. Um, and um, let's see, we'll go to the next page. And this also sometimes translates into problems uh, uh, that are structural. So uh, we, we had uh, many findings of MRI abnormalities. So the EEG then, then uh, led us to uh, a, 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 uh, an MRI and a finding of a structural problem. Sometimes that was actually treatable in some situations. So unexpected uh, EEG abnormalities um, uh, you can, uh, should be suspected in patients with various types of neurological, neurodevelopmental, neuropsychological disorders, even if there's a non-epilepsy or non-seizure presentation. Uh, evaluation should incorporate uh, various aspects of uh, neurophysiological or electrical, if you will, uh, uh, evaluation as well as neuropsychological cognitive testing. Uh, and in some situations, uh, treatment, even, a, even of... Uh, just the electrical activity can lead to behavioral improvements. So again, we're leading with spectrum disorders, not just on the autism side, but also on the epilepsy side, and they're often very connected. Uh, just some real-time uh, examples. Uh, Six-year-old, uh, diagnosis of uh, autism, history of events you can see here, just eye rolling vertically upward. Had a conventional EG that was read as normal. Uh, child was noted to be behaviorally difficult and was uh, Really, you know, though it was a normal EEG, it was probably not a very well obtained or quality EEG. It was referred to us. Uh, we we uh, put this child under a desensitization protocol using our music therapist. We were able to get a good quality EEG, and there were 183 of these spike discharges. And you can see here, this is this, what we call a spike in a slow wave. Uh, and this is the uh, high density EEG, all 128 electrodes flattened out. Uh, we could also take that information and data and plot it actually on an MRI, and you can see here it localizes. Uh, to, this is the sort of left side of the with the L, and this is the frontal parietal part of the brain. You can see it here from the side, from the back to front view, and from the sort of top view. This led to treatment with a seizure medicine called levetiracetam. Uh, 
uh, there was complete spike suppressions. In other words, that 183 spikes then, then were not seen on subsequent EEGs. And there was improvement in communication and social awareness and interaction. Uh, this is an 11-year-old uh, history of delay in language, uh, as, as well as other issues that you see here. Diagnosed with autism at five years of age, at nine years of age, developed episodes of staring. And again, a conventional EEG was normal and then was referred to us. Was treated more psychiatrically, if you will, with psychiatric psychotropic medications. Uh, we confirmed the, uh, the autism diagnosis. Uh, there were other behavioral issues. But the EEG was quite, quite interesting. It had what's called a 2.5, 3.0 hertz spike in slow wave or a very electrical pattern. Uh, it got worse with a, with a flashing light or photic stimulation. Uh, genetics showed an abnormality, uh, an extra X chromosome, which is a, a genetic syndrome. Uh, and it did change our treatment because now we're treating uh, not just the psychiatric behavioral symptoms, but uh, actually treating the uh, seizure itself. And just to mention also, uh, it, it really can't give a lecture anymore uh, on epilepsy autism connections without understanding genetics, because in many of these cases, it's the underlying genetic variant or genetic cause that's really, that's really leading to this connection between the two, two disorders. Uh, one thing, uh, genetic lab reports are, are somewhat constrained. So sometimes uh, you might be, uh, you might have gone for genetic testing or, or had your child have genetic testing uh, and the uh, genetic lab come, or lab report comes back as normal. Um, and this, and then you, you say to yourself, well, it's normal uh, report, so therefore it's not genetic. And that's not necessarily true on many different levels. First of all, the uh, lab reports are, somewhat constrained on what they could actually say on that report. They can only report genetic changes uh, that have previously been reported, if you will, in the literature. There are many, many new things that are occurring all the time. And, and as a physician, we can sometimes analyze uh, variants in a different sort of uh, approach uh, that can lead to changes in clinical management that, again, the lab can't do because they're not actually seeing the patient. They're not actually evaluating the patient. They're just looking at the test. Um, so again, a negative lab report doesn't rule this out. So if you do what's called a deeper dive or a reanalysis of the raw sequencing data, uh, often you can uncover important abnormalities that are, again are not seen on the or not reported on the on the on the lab report. So we we have this neurogenomics program that that uh, addresses this issue and problem of trying to translate genetic information into something that's more clinically useful and what we call actionable. That means you know how does it change uh, clinical management. Um, and you can see here, we did report uh, in 2019, and we have some more improved uh, data on this that we'll be uh, submitting for publication in the near future, uh, where many times we could find things uh, that, are, that are what we call actionable or change clinical management, uh, even though the uh, lab report was normal. And you can see here some of the things that we found and how it changed things. Um, so actionability of genetic results uh, are establishing a biological diagnosis. Uh, it ends sometimes what's called the diagnostic journey. We'll show you an example of that. Uh, if you have a molecular or genetic diagnosis, you might not necessarily have to pursue other testing uh, that may be uh, invasive at times. Um, you could get more proactive about disease treatment and monitoring rather than just suppressing symptoms. And at least this whole concept of precision medicine where we're starting to target treatments based upon underlying biological mechanisms rather than just trying to suppress externalizing symptoms and signs. And again, it can inform you about therapeutic options that you might not have thought about. Uh, I could tell you about other organs that might be at risk because there might be a shared genetic mechanism affecting other organ systems like the heart or, 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 or maybe a cancer predisposition, but also could affect the brain and uh, create an epilepsy risk or an autism risk. Um, Actionability of genetic results also can inform people about inheritance risk. You know, what's the chance of passing this on or maybe other family members that might be affected. Um, you can identify, again, very unknown or unsuspected clinical conditions you might uncover. And it answers a lot of the W questions about, you know, why did this happen? Uh, will it happen again? So this is a 20-year-old, uh, as you can see here, uh, 
had various uh, psychiatric uh, diagnoses, as you can see here, autism, Tourette, schizophrenia, and post control disorder. Uh, multiple psychiatric medications uh, were used with a lot of side effects, as you might imagine from these types. Uh, but there was a history of two seizures prior to five years of age that, were, that we uncovered in the history uh, and seemed to be sort of lost over time, uh, the significance of these seizures. Uh, and then presented again with these persistent sort of clenching of the hands and facial grimacing. And as far as a lot of testing we went through, the EEG was abnormal showing spikes. And genetic testing had a number of different uh, variants, as you can see here. And this did change our management because two of the uh, one of the variants you can see is CACNA1H in particular uh, was called what's a cal it's called a calcium channel gene, uh, particularly a T-type calcium channel that has been associated with epilepsies. Uh, and this led to a therapy uh, for the epilepsy using a T-type calcium channel blocker, uh, which led to improvements. So again, we're in this era of what's called personalized precision medicine, where we uh, utilize an individual's genetic information, but also other, other uh, information, biological information, medical information, and trying to establish a really uh, good uh, clinical profile. In other words, what's, what's the output and function of the brain, but also trying to figure out from the inside, from the biological side, what's causing these problems and not just trying to suppress symptoms, but again, trying to understand disease processes and disrupt that. And neurogenomics has played a very big role in this. It's extremely cost-effective. But again, if we're talking about the autism epilepsy uh, connection, uh, you really now need to talk about genetics as part of that as a major role uh, because of the uh, un uh, often having the underlying common uh, source of the cause of the problem. So again, uh, when it comes to uh, individuals with autism who also have epilepsy or have, have epilepsy and then develop autism, uh, you know, think about the common biological mechanism that they might share. Uh, think about treatment of epilepsy by help their autism and sometimes vice versa. Uh, and uh, think about how you can uh, do different uh, diagnostic testing for epilepsy and or autism uh, that might explain one or the other or both. <laughs> 